Lines are one-dimensional, but if you put several lines together in the right way, a second dimension emerges, something more complex than any of the individual lines. Human beings are complex creatures. We make decisions based on a variety of factors. Genetics, upbringing, feelings, beliefs, desires, and so on. Much of what we do can't be explained in terms of one specific factor, so one-dimensional explanations of our behavior are, are often misguided. Take jihad. What causes jihad? Is it poverty? If so, shouldn't we see jihad among all poor people, whether Muslim or not? Is Islam the cause? If it were, wouldn't everyone who believes in Islam be a jihadist? One-dimensional explanations won't help us understand jihad because it isn't the result of one factor. It's the result of three. If you're missing any of the three factors, the new dimension doesn't emerge. But when all three come together, they form what we'll call the jihad triangle. First factor, belief in Islam. To become a jihadist, you have to believe that there is no God but Allah, that Muhammad is his messenger, and that you have access to the commands of Allah and Muhammad. Islam is foundational because if you don't believe in Allah, you're not going to wage jihad for him. You might fight for other things, but it won't be jihad. Second factor, knowledge of what Islam commands. You can believe in Islam without knowing that Allah commands Muslims to fight those who do not believe in Allah, or that Muhammad declared, I've been ordered to fight people till they say there is no God but Allah. When I quote these passages to westernized Muslims, they generally have no clue what I'm talking about, even though I'm quoting Allah and Muhammad. But the jihadist is familiar with these kinds of passages. So jihadists aren't merely Muslims. They're Muslims who know that they've been commanded to violently subjugate unbelievers. Third factor, obedience. The world is filled with people who choose the path of least resistance, people who do whatever makes them feel most comfortable. But some people are wired differently. They are willing to do whatever they believe is right, regardless of the consequences. You can kill them, they won't back down. This character trait, when combined with certain noble values, gives rise to heroes, men and women who will lay down their lives to help others. But when it's combined with belief in Islam and knowledge of Allah's commands, it results in obedience and a willingness to fight the unbelievers and the hypocrites and be unyielding to them. So belief in Islam by itself doesn't produce jihad. Knowledge of what Islam teaches by itself doesn't produce jihad. Obedience by itself doesn't produce jihad. Any two of these factors combined without the third won't produce jihad. You can believe in Islam and be thoroughly willing to obey Allah as long as you don't know that he commands you to wage jihad. You can believe in Islam and know that Allah commands you to wage jihad as long as obeying Allah isn't a priority. You can know what Allah commands and be the sort of person who's willing to lay down his life for what he believes as long as you don't believe in Islam. Once we understand that the triangle requires all three sides, we can start to answer some of the more common questions about Islam and violence. For instance, we often hear the question, if Islam is violent, why are there so many peaceful Muslims? Well, most Muslims in the West only have one of the three sides. They have belief in Islam, but they don't know what Islam teaches. And even if you tell them what Islam teaches, they're not going to obey if it's something they don't like. My conversations with Westernized Muslims usually go something like this. The Muslim says, Islam is a religion of peace. I respond by quoting a bunch of passages from the Quran. Then the Muslim says, you're ignoring the context. So I take him through the context. At that point, he calls me an Islamophobe and says there's no point in talking to me. Notice, even when the commands and the context are spread out in front of them, many Muslims simply will not obey. They'll always be one side shy of a triangle. Another common confusion surrounds the issue of radicalization. How many times have we heard, he was such a polite boy growing up, we don't understand how he ended up with a group like ISIS. It's actually pretty straightforward. You see, either he was raised with one of the three sides, belief in Islam, or he acquired the belief side through conversion. Either way, having the belief side opens the door for the recruiter to start working on the other two sides. You think Allah wants you to live in peace with unbelievers? You got that idea from the unbelievers, not from Allah. Let me show you what Islam really teaches. With the second side firmly in place, the recruiter then shifts his attention to obedience. You think you get to pick and choose which of Allah's commands you obey, as if our religion is some sort of lunch buffet? Allah demands complete submission, and if you don't obey, you're not a real Muslim. You're going to hell. There are plenty of young Muslims out there who will resist the recruiter. Nothing will convince them to obey. But some will pack their bags and book the next flight to Turkey, one way. Now, is it just me, or is this really, really simple? What have we discussed that a five-year-old couldn't understand? And if a five-year-old can get this, why are politicians and the media so confused by jihad? As it turns out, there's another shape at work among politicians and the media. I call it the octagon of spinelessness. But I think we've discussed enough geometry for one day.